Welcome to MMO Grinder Side Quest, where I take a look at... Well, my normal opening really doesn't apply here. Today I'll be looking at Pokemon Go, the recently released mobile app based upon the Pokemon universe, taking most inspiration from Generation 1, but using plenty of aspects from the modern games as well, including all the new Pokemon types. Now, before I get started, I wanted to talk a bit about another game called Ingress. Trust me, it's pretty important to understanding a lot of the weird parts of Pokemon Go, but if you really don't care to find out, then just go ahead and uh, click here to skip ahead. Uh, unless you're on mobile, of course, in which case, uh, here's your timestamp. Started by Pokemon Go's developer and offshoot of Google, Niantic, Ingress is basically Google Maps the MMO. Story-wise, an otherworldly energy called XM was found leaking out of various portals at sites of interest around the world. You choose to control this energy by placing harvesters at portals and allying yourself with one of two factions. The Resistance, who seek to fight against this energy, and the Enlightened, who wish to embrace and control it. Or basically, which color do you like better, blue or green? The basics boil down to finding a portal in the world, using them to get higher in level so that you can take out higher portals, and interacting with them to get small piles of items. Sound familiar, Pokemon Go fans? Because it should. The problems with Ingress all stemmed from the fact that starting out, there was little to nothing that you could do. Most portals were already harvested by players whose level would far outshine yours, and you rarely got many things to do with them besides item collection or hoping you'd find a dead portal to claim. The portals in Ingress initially were all user-submitted. They could be local businesses, artwork in cities, statues, cemeteries, churches, and if this still isn't sounding familiar to you, they're the Pokestops. Yes, all Niantic did was take the existing portals from Ingress and make them gyms and Pokestops in Pokemon Go. That's some top-tier laziness, Niantic. This is why there's reports of strip clubs and dark alleyways being Pokestops. This is why Westboro Baptist Church is a Pokemon gym. I'm serious, look it up. I will say that the phenomenon that is Pokemon Go is already far outshining Ingress. Niantic said Ingress was more of a prototype game, with Pokemon Go being something that they really wanted to put effort and time into. With the apparent success of Pokemon Go so far, I'll believe it. Okay, so enough about Ingress, though I will be bringing it up on occasion, so let's get into Pokemon Go. The graphics and models are polished, but it's pretty rough to run on older phones, even though that's the least of its technical problems right now. The game is a crash-happy, server-melting wonder, and there's few things more frustrating than seeing your phone lock up and freeze because the server is unable to decide if you actually caught that Venomoth or not. I've lost plenty of good catches to this, including a Tauros that spawned in my neighborhood that I was able to successfully hunt down right before it crashed during the catching process. I am not entirely over this. I'm quite surprised how good this music is. Like, it's remixes of some of the classic tracks, but they have a ton of energy that you probably won't even notice over the noise of the outside and the tinny feedback of your phone's speaker. Look up the tracks sometime, since I'm talking over them right now. In fact, hearkening back to Generation 1 in the games, more than the anime, each Pokémon makes an updated version of its original Pokémon Screech. I think Pikachu still says Pikachu, though. Nintendo probably has that as a contractual obligation, though. As I mentioned a few times already, Pokémon Go currently only uses Pokémon from Generation 1, the original 151, so to speak. I can see why they chose this. Gen 1's been around for 20 years, and was the generation that was around during the peak of the Pokémon craze in the US. Each Pokémon is iconic and has a set of diehard fans. Some of you might be upset that you won't be able to get a Togepi or a Gardevoir, but with the system in place for how this game works, anything more than Gen 1's set would probably be impossibly overwhelming. I'll explain in a bit. To start the game, you get a rather simple character customization, giving you a scant few choices and the option to enter a name and date of birth. You'll see three Pokémon to choose from, the three starters, Charmander, Bulbasaur, and Squirrel. This decision is almost pointless as you catch any of these guys in the wild, and you don't use other Pokémon to catch Pokémon anyway. And before anyone adds this, you can actually force the game to give you a startup Pikachu instead by walking away from your initial three choices four or five times until Pikachu spawns as a choice. How your starters appeared will also be how Pokémon will appear in the world. As you walk around and look down at the map, a Pokémon might spawn near you. Click on it on the map and you'll begin the encounter. Note that I don't say battle because you don't use your Pokémon to fight against wild Pokémon. You only have two options, toss out food items or whip Pokéballs at their face. Pokémon Go has just turned the entire planet of Earth into the Safari Zone. To toss a Pokéball, drag and flick the ball towards the Pokémon on the screen. As you hold down the ball, a circle will appear on the Pokémon with a shrinking circle in the middle of varying color. Green for easy, yellow for medium, orange for hard, and red for very hard. 
The likelihood your Pokémon will break out of the ball increases with that difficulty. But the game seems to have its own agenda sometimes. That is, if you can even get the ball to land inside the white or colored circle. And you can get yourself a slightly better chance of catching the Pokémon by hitting the center of the colored circle as it gets smaller. Miss that white circle entirely, or have the game lag and freak out on you when you're trying to toss, and you've just lost that ball. A neat way to play the game, which would be a good way to get it to freak out and lag on you, is to use the AR mode, which will use your phone's back-facing camera to place that Pokémon in the world itself. Which is made for some interesting photo ops for some people. As cool as it is, if you're finding the game troubling to run with it on, it's a simple switch on the battle screen. While wandering aimlessly can get you a few Pokémon, you're better off seeing what's near you on the tracker. This tracker lists all Pokémon in your general area with a hot and cold mechanic, revealed in the order that they're listed, as well as the footprints next to them, ranging from 3 at the furthest to 0 at the closest. If you choose a specific Pokémon from the list and track it to 0 footprints, it will automatically spawn on your map. You gain experience with each capture, every successful trip to a Pokéstop, fighting in gyms, or just evolving your Pokémon. Your level dictates the rarity and power of the Pokémon that you're likely to see, as well as granting permission for higher tier items and gym access. In order to level and evolve Pokémon, you need Stardust and Candies. Candies are specific to the base evolution Pokémon and higher, so to evolve a Pidgey to a Pidgeotto, you need 12 Pidgey Candies. To evolve Pidgeotto to Pidgeot, you need 50 Pidgey Candies. You'll get three candies per capture, one when you transfer a Pokémon to the Professor, and a larger amount for hatching an egg. Standard leveling requires Stardust as well as a candy or few, depending on that Pokémon's power or CP, standing for combat points. You won't be able to get your Pokémon past a certain CP level until you increase your trainer level, so no Uber Pidgets for you. Similar to how portals in Ingress function, Pokéstops are areas marked on the map that consist of various sites and buildings. Public parks will tend to have a lot of them. Find a Pokéstop and stand close enough to it to change its shape, and you can spin on the icon to receive a small stash of items, usually Pokéballs, but you can later find potions, revives, and Pokémon eggs which will hatch in incubators by walking. In order to hatch an egg, go to the Pokémon list, click on Eggs, and pick an egg to place into your incubator. Eggs require various amounts of walking distance to hatch, and no, you can't just drive your way to hatched eggs. Also featured in locations similar to Pokestops are gyms, which are the basis of this game's combat and competition. At level 5, you're asked to choose between three teams. Team Instinct, who go with their gut and use Zapdos as their emblem. Team Mystic, who prefer studying and strategy in their battles and use Articuno in their emblem. And Team Valor, for those who prefer strength and training in combat and use the last legendary bird, Moltres, as their emblem. Or basically, which color do you like better, yellow, blue, or red? Pick one and you're well on your way to becoming an intolerable insult-spewing jerk online to anyone who didn't choose the same color as you. Say you've stumbled upon a hypothetical empty gym, which, by the way, good luck with that! You can assign one of your Pokémon to claim that gym for your team and collect bonuses each day as long as you have at least one assigned. What's more likely to happen is you'll stumble across an already claimed gym. If it's your color, you can assign a Pokémon to any empty slots, or battle with the gym to increase its prestige and level it up, granting even more slots to the gym, and making it harder for other teams to take down. Combat is supposed to consist of well-timed dodges with side swipes, as well as quick and heavy attacks by tapping and holding the screen. Though, you'll find it usually better to just rapidly tap on the screen to whittle down the opponent, as the game's servers aren't so kind to allow for precise inputs at the moment. When you battle with your own gym, you can only choose one Pokémon, and when it's defeated in battle, it'll be taken down to 1 HP rather than fainted. If it's the opposing team's gym, you can choose from 6 Pokémon to fight it, and each victory removes some of that gym's prestige. Remove it all, and the gym goes empty, allowing you or others to take up the slot. The reason you won't find any empty gyms, or even keep a Pokémon in it for more than 15 minutes, is because EVERYONE is playing this game. The first day I downloaded it and took it to a local park, I came across at least 20 other people visibly and openly playing, and that number has doubled every single day I've gone since. To call this game a runaway success and a phenomenon is barely scratching the surface, and I'm rather shocked all the places that it's showing up. My local gym, like actually workout gym, even had the post a sign to stop non-members from meandering about the place looking for stray machops. Comparatively, I was playing Ingress for about two years, and I never once saw a single other person playing that game. Speaking of Ingress, if you skipped over that aside, I'll just quickly state once again that every odd Pokestop location is a direct result of the user-submitted nature of Ingress, as Niantic only ported over everything that was submitted. 
Now that the Holocaust Museum and the Korean DMZ are poke stops, I think Niantic is going to have to own up to some of the choices they made, as it's already causing one hell of a controversy, and plenty of public businesses have been accepting or refusing this game's popularity outright. And it's barely been out a week! You may have also heard this game is making serious bank, and the in-app purchases are all the reason. The game uses a coin-for-money exchange system, and while you can earn coins by holding gems and getting that defender bonus for each day, good luck with that. I wouldn't rely on it. Instead, the coins come in various packs with increasing bonus coins at higher amounts, from the expected 1 for 100 to the troubling 14,500 for $100. Remember that you can get some of these items featured in the cash shop just by leveling up. You can buy Pokeballs if you're terrible at tossing them and don't want to farm Pokestops. Incense will attract Pokemon to your location without having to hunt for them. It seems to be about one every five minutes and lasts a half hour. People tend to use them for going on a long hunt, or if they just want to catch Pokemon without having to leave their bed. You'll know you have an active Incense when your character is surrounded by purple smoke. Lucky Eggs are experience boosters, not something you can hatch. They double whatever XP you gain as you play. It's very useful to power level yourself by evolving a bunch of low-level commons at once while one is active. If a Lucky Egg is active, your character will sparkle. A Lure Mod is like an incense except it works on Pokestops. They also last a half hour. Any Pokestop with a Lure Mod on it will be showering confetti. Finally, you can separately upgrade the storage space of your Pokémon and your items by 50 for 200 coins a pop. Item storage is far more useful as items are counted by individual item, not by stacks, and you start with a ton of space for Pokémon already. As long as you remember to transfer your Rattata army every now and again, you'll have plenty of room for a while. I feel this game is the idea of Pokémon perfectly realized, but not the perfect Pokémon game. If your idea of Pokémon is heading around the world to locate and capture strong or rare Pokémon, this game is likely all for you. If you prefer the type matchup, strategy, trainer battles, facing down the Elite Four, and expected some kind of one-for-one -one recreation of Pokémon in real life, you'll probably be disappointed, and should likely just wait for Pokémon Sun and Moon to release. Pokémon Go isn't the best at being a Pokémon game, but it's about the most interactive AR mobile game I've seen, and right now there are tons of people playing it. We'll just see what happens once the initial craze and the honeymoon period is over. I would like to say that there are two things that this game needs to get done immediately, as well as some things that would be nice to see in the future. First off, I think everyone would agree with me, but these servers need to be fixed pronto, and this game is in dire need of optimization. This is a game that relies on a sturdy connection and a stable platform, and unless they can implement some sort of offline leeway, until those servers are stable, prepare to curse incessantly as you lose a rare Pokémon to a lost connection or a game freeze. If I ended up losing my first Jigglypuff to a game crash, my phone would have entered low Earth orbit. You owe me like 15 Weedles, 8 Vulpixes, 1 Tauros, and a Venomoth Niantic. Of course, it's frustrating to miss out on some Pokémon, only to see a friend with a pile of that Pokémon. Which is why they need to get to working on this touted trade system. I'm starting to think that some people don't even realize it's not in the game yet. And while Niantic has announced that they would implement it, there's no real turnaround time on that. They might be too busy drowning in $100 bills. Once those other issues are sorted, I'd like to think some more trainer customization options should be in place. I can't be the only one who thinks that these designs don't really look all that Pokémon. And such a limited amount of choice means you'll notice your clones staffing gyms of all types. I honestly wouldn't care if that became a cash shop item. Just don't make me have to look like a spiky-haired 3D cartoon reject. While I don't know if there's a way to implement this in the current system, seeing 1v1 trainer battles could be nice. It would allow for players to practice against their friends for gym battles, maybe even make it so Pokémon don't get injured or even level up during this as to not waste potions, but I don't see that happening. Of course, some people chose a team with no knowledge of what their friends chose or what gyms would most likely appear near them, or they're being harassed in submission online by a bunch of nerds who still haven't gotten a handle on sportsmanship. Being able to change your team, not on the fly, mind, but possibly earned or purchased, might alleviate those already too invested to try it again with a new account. So what do I think of the game? I like it a lot more than I thought I would. It took a while to grow on me, what with Niantic's absolutely awful manner of explaining its mechanics, but this definitely is more of the kind of game that I wanted Ingress to be. There's always something to do, even if you're not at a super high level. And there's something exciting about seeing an unknown silhouette popping up on your tracker. Hell, I took a break from writing this very script to run outside and catch a coughing, if that helps illustrate the point for you. We'll see how I feel about this after a month, but for now, I have plenty of parks to visit. This has been an MMO Grinder side quest, and it's time I logged out.